want to like be comfortable from the plastic chairs I guess not um, let me grab this so who just just so I kind of have an idea what's going how many in here are running businesses already of their own so we got a handful all students right now all members of the Weber Entrepreneurs Association or couple okay I'll give me an idea of what's going on um, I didn't bring prepare a lot of slides because I just figured I'd have a few things that just remind me of stories and if you have any questions like I mean we can open up for Q&A at the end but if you have any questions while I'm talking please feel free to interrupt me so my background is pretty entrepreneurial my family uh, my grandparents were both like World War II vets and came home and like lived the American dream one started a gas station uh, down where like Washington Terrace meets Riverdale Road and the other one had just a bunch of other service-based businesses similar like service stations and stuff auto body shop painting stripes on streets and things like that my dad was an entrepreneur he was a, a software developer and he wrote some applications that were used to manage cases for the Better Business Bureau and uh, a bunch of like tomato farms in California so it's kind of pretty niche and pretty random but that's like where like just there's always been like this entrepreneurial blood there's four kids I'm the youngest and all four of us have run our own businesses and right now all but one are currently still running their own businesses just I don't know what why I, I mean we're pretty different pretty weird I don't really know what what kind of created that but it's like you know we've all got that same bug um, I put born salesman like entrepreneur not because like I think I'm the best salesman in the world because I don't think that's the case it's just like I was born with this like disease that I like to hustle and like to sell people and like to get people to buy things that I have. I really love to like create something and get people to pay money for it. That's just been like just this thing I've always had. Little kid with the with the you know lemonade stand. Next there was baseball cards on there and just kind of evolved from there. And in high school I mentioned like like the the bio said I went to Roy High. I was I I slept my very first day as a sophomore. That's how like terrible I was like one class come out of class and somebody's like hey you want to go to Del Taco I'm like yeah man you know like let's leave and never I don't think I ever went to a full day of high school I I think I slept every single day I never earned an attendance credit um, lost all those hundreds of hours of community service and I hustled my way out of those like I didn't do them and so this <laughs> that's kind of like who I who I've been and so in high school I was always looking for opportunities when eBay came out um, started selling things on eBay I paid th for my first semester of college from just selling junk I found anywhere on eBay um, and in one of my first like times I ever like invested money which it wasn't much it was like $12 was I found out about this store down in, in like the ghetto in like the avenues of Ogden over here called the Mercantile where they would buy like wrecked semi trucks of garbage and sell it and they had like these Reese's peanut butter cups and like cases of Reese's peanut butter cups and like country time lemonade for like a buck and so I like bought a bunch of this stuff threw it in the back of my truck and our soccer team at the time was undefeated and won the state championship that year and so I drove to the soccer game and sold all these Reese's peanut butter cups and you know like for cheap you know it was like you know you want know, 50 cents 50 cents for a king size you know Reese's peanut butter cup seemed like a pretty good deal and for me it was like you know I paid two cents for that so I've always just kind of been looking for the next next thing to sell next thing to hustle and um, kind of stumbled into startups so in 1999 uh, I attended my first funeral so like my great-grandmother died and she was at Myers, like they did the service at Myers down on 7th Street in, in, uh, on Washington Boulevard. First time I'd ever been to a funeral, I wasn't going there looking for business opportunities. Like definitely not. I was 15, so it's not like I definitely wasn't going there for that reason. But um, I, so I'd never been to a funeral. I kind of expected this thing to be like super gloomy and depressing and like, man, this is going to be the worst hour of my life. And uh, left and I was like, man, that was actually pretty cool. Like my dad spoke and told all these stories and my brother sang a song and at the end of it I, I thought well that was actually kind of inspiring like I never really knew her like I you know visited her house I don't know 30 times in my life and never really knew her story so to like go to the funeral in one hour just like you know you learn someone's whole life what they were passionate about what their hobbies were because all I could picture was this lady that sat in a chair and that's it you know I mean she didn't do anything else she didn't have a TV I mean she just sat there I didn't think she read I have no idea what she did but like she had a really cool life that I learned in that one hour and so when the service was over uh, one of the funeral directors at Myers Mortuary gave us a cassette tape like audio cassette tape recording of the funeral service 
And so we're, as a family, kind of joking, like, you know, where are we going to listen to this cassette? Like, we're all, you know, CDs are cool now. Like, why do we need these cassette tapes? And so we were just kind of joking about that. And my brother, he's my oldest brother, is a musician and had a recording studio, and he's been doing that kind of a lifestyle for 30 years. And he, he was like, hey, I've got all the gear. Like, we should go to these funerals and record them and put them on CDs, you know, and do digital. It'll last longer than the cassette. People will be excited. They can, you know, skip through tracks. Because if you remember the cassette days, it was like when you wanted to hear that one song, it was like search, 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 find it, play it, and then you want to hear it again. It was miserable to try to rewind back to that, right? So that was like, like okay, this seems like a great idea. So part of the reason I slept class is we started funeralrecording.com. At the time, we called it Mountain West Memories. And so my brother invested the money for equipment. He taught me what to do because I had no idea how to do that. And we basically did what, what I've got right here. Like we first we started taking microphones and recording the service, like setting up like a portable recording studio at the funeral home or at the church. We would charge the funeral home 300 bucks to go and record it and put it on the CDs. And, and I don't know what they would, they would up, upsell that to the family, you know. But like back then it was like it was really hard to get a digital recording. That you didn't have these little pocket recorders like we do now. And so that's that's kind of what kicked it off. So I would skip class and go to funerals and set up this recording studio and go back home and get on my Mac and you know like edit all the talks into their own tracks and put them on a CD and print one of those sweet labels that you know you use a CD stomper and stick the label on there and it peels off and damages somebody's CD player. So that was like what I did. And so I did that throughout throughout high school and it was always just kind of like a side project amongst what other things I was doing. And I uh, graduated from high school, worked a regular job for a year, uh, went on a mission. And when I came back, I kind of went to my brother and I said, man, are you still doing that funeral stuff? Because I came back and got a job. I'm like, this sucks. Like, I hate working, you know, for people. I love to work, but I hate working for people. So I was like, I got to do something. So went and asked him, like, are you still doing this? He's like, yeah, we still got, you know, I mean, before I left, like, on my mission, there was, like, Myers and we got this Russin Brothers Mortuary, if anybody's from Davis County. We had those two funeral homes, like, working with us. And... You know, a busy week, we might do like four funerals or three or something. It was, we weren't doing a whole lot of volume, but that was, that was what we were doing. So I came back and, you know, asked him like, what's going on? He's like, yeah, I'm still doing that. We've got four or five funeral homes now and we're giving them these digital recorders like I've got in my pocket. And um, they just set it up, they record it, and then they, they're sending us the files and then we're editing them and making the CDs and sending it back. So we're not going to funerals anymore. I'm like, well, that sounds pretty cool. And so... Um, I got involved in that and started going, selling more funeral homes in Utah just to see, like, you know, is this a viable product? Can we get it to grow? And I had no idea. I mean, I wasn't thinking in my mind, is this a viable product? Because I was an idiot. Like, I didn't know anything. <laughs> like, I, did, I was so stupid. So I was just going to funeral homes and trying to explain, you know, what we did. Got a few more on board, thought this seemed like a pretty good deal. So I bought the business for my brother. And this, and you know, we built funeralrecording.com, made it into an actual website. They would upload the audio. We would edit it, stream it on the internet, and then um, got the idea. Like, you know, I think we can we can like live stream funerals. So if you can't go, you can watch them live on the internet. And I'll tell you about a little bit more about that in a minute. But like, so I built this like webcasting thing for funeral recording. And in the meantime, like I'm going to school here at Weber State. I got involved in the Weber Entrepreneurs Association, which was like one of the better opportunity education opportunities I had up here. Uh, learned so much. Built some mentor. I mean, I can still remember my first meeting. I went and sat down, and I had my like BlackBerry under the table because people were saying these acronyms like a PNL or like IPO or like saying EBITDA, and I'm like, I have no idea what these things are. So I'm like, here I am running a business for a year, and I'm like, tech, you know, googling what is an IPO, <laughs> what is a PNL, PNL. I didn't know what that was, but I was running my own QuickBooks. It was I was so dumb. So. Anyways, I got this product built, the webcasting thing, started another company while I was here at school called Webcast Online and started selling to um, local like cities and towns so they could stream their city council meetings. And we got that going in like Kaysville, Fruit Heights, and uh, the one that used it for the longest was West Valley City. But I hated how long it took to sell. It was like, you gotta go city council, they gotta you know, deliberate about this crap and then wait for budget meetings. It took forever. So that, that business was, it, you, I, I kind of call that one a failure. Like it made money, had these few cities sending me a few hundred bucks a month. Just I wasn't doing anything for it. Like the work was all just automated software. But that was kind of a bomb. Did another one called Beef Lick. It was like it's the worst name ever because it sounds like you're licking like a slice of beef. But that's not what it was meant. So I was like, how do you spell that? B E E F? No. <laughs> like you know, it was beef. That, that was a terrible bomb too. Started this 
like online film festival, ran a couple film festivals, and got some pretty cool prizes. We got like 30 grand worth of stuff, gave it away at a couple film festivals, and it just, it just sucked. Like it, same kind of thing. Like we just bombed that. These, so these are just five that I've listed. Overall, I started eight businesses. Um, two that were like that didn't even last like more than like a week. So I didn't figure those were even worth listing. Um, started two kios in 2010 because in the funeral industry i started seeing like so many people were asking me that we're, we were doing these recordings for because we grew the recording thing to a couple hundred funeral homes and thought oh, this is pretty sweet had the webcasting live streaming of funerals going and um everyone was asking like can you make our slideshow videos for us and it was like no nah, i don't i don't want to get into that because the whole audio recording thing we were doing with the editing i hated like having someone edit funerals and having someone like print cds and like mail them out like that that part was miserable. I love the webcasting and stuff where it was just like, we make money for doing nothing. Like all I gotta do is spend my time selling and hustling and doing what I like to do. And then the business just runs itself. And I really loved that. So I, I was trying to figure that out. So when these people were coming saying like, can you do our slideshow videos? I was like, no, nah, we're not gonna do that. Um, and that was, that probably started in like 2007, 2008, these questions are coming. And finally I'm like, you know what? Like let's build a slideshow creator that makes the video for these guys. So instead of like them bringing us a shoebox full of photos and saying like, hey, make this into a cool video, like let's make it where they can just upload those pictures. And instead of waiting 24 to 48 hours for the video to come back with all the animations and trans you know, transitions and effects and you know, intro videos and all this stuff, like instead of doing that, let's write software that'll do that. And so in 2010, launch Tukio's and that's what it is, is like instead of the funeral industry, what they're used to is shoebox full of photos, you hand it to the videographer in town, he goes and makes a video, he gives it back to you 48 hours later, the, you know, the visitation's about to start, you pop the DVD in and they spell the name wrong. So now it's like, holy crap, like what are you gonna do? And this guy's gotta somehow rush a video render that his computer can't handle and do that, it's, it's not gonna work. So we wrote software where that whole process, instead of being 48 hours, it's about five to 10 minutes. And so they just upload pictures or the family uploads pictures. And I mean, they can do this all from their phone where they can just say like, okay, like family came in, they want a video, give them this link to upload pictures, family uploads them, the software cranks all the video out in just a couple minutes. And then they can say like, if it's Myers, they can say like, I need this at our Layton location tonight at eight o'clock. And so when someone walks into the TV, the video is already there, no DVD, nothing like that. So it's totally digital, totally automated. It's really been, been really awesome. But the cool thing about it is like the industry already existed. There were already software as a service providers doing video slideshows. And so it was easy to come in and say, we got a better way to do it. We got a faster way to do it. We got a less expensive way to do it. And just to come and just like eat market share. So 2010, we started it. There's like this kind of, um, un you know, this thing in the funeral industry where it's like, they come to a trade show to see you and then they're gonna come back next year to a trade show to see you and if you're not, like if you're there the first time, like they're not gonna buy from you. You're there a second time, you're gonna get the early adopters. That's so they're pretty slow early adopters, right? It takes them like a year to know you're in business. So that first year, 2010 was tough. Like luckily I had a couple hundred funeral homes that were already using me for webcasting stuff. So I could just go to them and say, here's a new product, you guys should use it. And we just, we got those guys right away. But everyone else, it kind of took a couple years before they started to trust us and to really believe that our brand was gonna be around. And so that's, um, that's kind of where Tukio's is now. So it's grown. We're the second largest like software provider in the funeral industry. I think we'll have the number one spot by the end of this year. We're growing at a fast enough clip. And we've got about, employees wise, I've got 13 guys, but there's, uh, we've got about 250 sales reps that sell our product day to day in funeral homes through distribution channels we've got. And so we never make cold calls. Like we never prospect. We never do anything like that. We just have leads coming in all day. And it's just trying to activate those leads, which is a, a whole you know thing in, in and of itself. It's kind of tough. So while that was all going on, because I've got ADD and can't focus on anything, I had this idea for a company called Bragfire that uh, took our video rendering technology, which is actually, that's the kind of the core of our business. Like if anyone in here has ever used iMovie or Windows Movie Maker or Pro Show Gold or anything like video creators, After Effects, Premiere, you like make a video, it's 10 minutes long, and then you're like, okay, I need to render this out in HD, and you tell it to save, it's 10 minutes long and it takes like 45 minutes or two hours for it to like render your video. That totally sucks, right? So two KOs can render at a thousand frames per second and we can do lots of videos at the same time. So if a video is 10 minutes long, we can render that thing in 60 seconds instead of, so that's kind of our core tech is like how we render video. So thinking like we got a better way to do that, let's take it to another industry. So I thought this whole idea up and I still think it's like one of the better ideas I've had, but it, it didn't work. 
Um, and that's, that's Bragfire. So I thought this thing like, well, okay, let's say we're going to create a word of mouth marketing machine and we're going to do it through video. So built this brand Bragfire and started selling to resorts and cruise lines around the world. And we got a lot of them. Like we got Westgate Resorts. We got a group called uh, Baya Principe. They got 27 resorts and one called uh, Fiesta Americana in Mexico. It's got like 30 resorts. We got a, a subsidiary of, of uh, Royal Caribbean. So we had clients in, and we still have clients with Bragfire in like Thailand, South Africa, all over the Caribbean and Mexico and all throughout the United States. And, and so it seemed like this great idea. We're like, you know, you're on a vacation. And kind of the idea, like what spawned this is I was on vacation all of a sudden I noticed I post an image to Facebook. And that was like the first time I'd ever post a picture on Facebook. And I was like, what am I doing? I'm one of those idiots that just like, well, look at me, I'm traveling, I'm on vacation. I want people to know, right? And I'm like, well, I'm probably not the only one like that. So I bet people like to brag about what they're doing. So that's where the name Bragfire came from. But basically what it was, you go to a resort, a resort sends you an email and you get home. And it says, thanks for staying at a resort. Make a free video from your phone in two minutes so you can show your friends how much fun this is. And so they go and they create this video, just pick their pictures from Instagram or Facebook. We had all these imports built from Flickr and every other photo like platform where people had already posted. And it would make this rad video, and you can see some of them I think on our website probably still, um, where like we have like we'd go and film the resort, we'd bring down the drones and have like their photos falling on the beach and make it really dynamic and really cool. And so people were making these and sharing them and we were just charging the resort like four or five grand a month for like unlimited videos at a location or something. And so it seemed so awesome because what would happen is you share this video on Facebook and now with since we shared it on Facebook, we can then put a link there where anyone that sees your video can come to the resort and we can offer them deals. And so we were able to prove like, man, we're we're closing deals like we're sending this resort people that are buying these they call them mini vacations if it's a resort that sells a timeshare and that was kind of like where we fell into is these timeshare resorts and so anyways it was super awesome um it still makes a couple hundred grand a year but it's it was we shut it down we shut down sales because the same kind of thing like two-year sales cycle similar to like selling to cities and i hated that like i love the idea of like hustle, meet somebody, close them, take money from them now, they're a client today, right? And so Bragfire still exists, but I think our website right now is more toward like filming promo videos and we've got, a, when someone picks that up, we send a couple of videographers down to just film a promo video, but we're not really selling that marketing platform anymore, which I still think is like awesome, but it probably made no sense how I just explained it. Maybe it did, hopefully it did. but. So that's kind of that's kind of that. I, I think I've gone through most of this timeline. So um, that's kind of where where all of this stuff took place. So Bragfire is not very old. You know, it's a few years old, but basically shut down. Tukios is my kind of my main focus. So what I want to just I, I've I've learned a ton of lessons along the way just from like being in the trench and doing it like in the grind. And uh, you know, everybody's different. I mean, you can read a book that'll say everything the opposite of what I'm, I'm about to say. And and ones that will agree with me, and that's fine. Just, you know, you got to take everything with a grain of salt and kind of do what works for you. But one of the things, I'm just going to share five things that I think are really important for, like, kind of starting out and trying to get, like, to actually build your brand. And uh, the first one is, like, to be different. So funeralrecording.com, like, you look at that website, and it fits in. If you, like, looked at that and then looked at every other funeral vendor website in the industry, it fits in perfectly. I mean, you, we could throw caskets on that page, and it would fit perfect, right? Um, and so what would happen, like, I'm going to these trade shows and like the very first, I didn't know what a trade show was until I'd already bought this business for my brother and someone's like, what, do you go to trade, are there funeral trade shows or did you go to a trade show? I'm like, what's a trade show? I never had, had even heard of one. Um, and so I found out what they were, found out there was one in a week. It was like next week in Las Vegas. I'm like, holy crap, and this is in 2007. I'm like, I got to go to this thing. I don't even know what it is and it's four grand, but I'm gonna, I don't have four grand, but I'm gonna find four grand and I'm gonna go. And so I went and set up this booth and borrowed like some of these things from people that had them already. And like some guys had one that were just, that all I had to do was like, they were just black and all, I just taped like, <laughs> like their logo on there and stuff, printed some stuff, alpha graphics and put it on there, it looked like crap. But like I'm, so I'm standing in this booth and people are coming by and I'm pulling them in off the aisle and I'm getting a stack of business cards and I'm thinking, man, like, I mean, I, I'm out to eat that night you know, in Vegas, like counting money. I think, I think I've just made it. Like I'm gonna blow this thing up because I just got 50 business cards and I'm gonna close every one of these guys. They're gonna at least pay me like, I don't know, like a million dollars a year. I had no idea, right? I just thought like, this is it, I've done it. And so the problem was like, I've got these business cards and I go home and I'm so excited to start like calling these people. And so first card, 
call the phone, like call them up and, and like I called the ones that were most interested first, right? Obviously. And so I called them like, hey, yeah, you guys were super excited about this. And this was just just doing audio recording at the time. I'm like you guys were so excited about this, like you ready to start? And they're like, well, who are you again? It's like funeralrecording.com. They're like, yeah, remind me. Like, well, we had the booth back by those guys and you know, our carpet was blue. I mean, it was like whatever I could do to try to make them remember who we were. I don't remember you. They're like, send me some stuff and I'll talk to you later. I'm like, well, that sucked. Like, so I throw that and then like call the next card. That was the whole thing. Like, it happened, the whole, the whole like stack of cards went that way. I got like two clients from that trade show. I'm like, man, that sucked, you know? So, like, I kept doing trade shows and like I st launched the webcasting and it just kept going the same way. Like, every time I go to a trade show, it's like taking me like a year to get any kind of re like return on investment on that and I'm like this is too long and so that's the reason behind like two kios this isn't what our website looks right now that's the very first version of our website you look at that and you're like okay a casket doesn't belong on this site right I think we did something different and so being different was really important for us like so I thought up this idea of building the slideshow creator and I'm like we're gonna build a brand in this industry and we're gonna be the weird guys because that's kind of who I am naturally I'm a little bit different than most people so I'm like we're gonna be the weird guys we wear bright green like and we're gonna like really stand out and so um, I'm like I was trying to come up with a name you know that would be weird and that's the first question anybody asks me how do you say that how do you spell that what is that um, and so I was trying to come up with a name and my, my wife and I were in, in Disney World with her family and all I'm thinking about is like business stuff and just trying to think of a name for this idea I've got for the slideshow creator and there, we were on this safari ride and this truck gets stuck because there's a hippopotamus in the road and he won't move. And so we're sitting there and the truck driver, it's like 150 degrees, I mean it's so hot and the truck driver's like got nothing to say. He's just, you know, making things up. And finally, he's like pointing around at stuff. And he's like, oh, that tree right there, which is actually like one of these trees, these weird looking trees. Um, he's like, that tree is a baobab tree and it means upside down in Swahili. And I was looking for a short URL, like a short name, you know, three syllables or less. And there are very few domain names available that fit that criteria with a .com, right? So, um, so I'm like, okay, there's gotta be something surrounding, like in, in the Swahili language that's like, and that fits my super weird idea that I've got for the brand. So Tukios means events in Swahili, meaning like we build videos around life events. And so I bought the domain name right there before the hippo had even got off the road. Like I'd search memories, videos, you know, and just kept searching things and trying to find the right word. And they're all really weird. This was like something at least most people could pronounce the first time they looked at it. So I'm like, I'm doing, dude, I'm doing that one. And so started Tukios with that name like that and it totally worked for like people remembering us you go to a trade show our trade show booth looks like that like that was the first one anyways and I'll show you our next like we've, we've done other ones since then so you can see like behind here there's that's that's caskets back here there's people selling like embalming fluid and the really fun thing to do at a funeral trade show is to do a body hoist and you like pretend you're a body and lay on a table and then someone can pick you up with a crane and put you in a casket. That's like the fun thing to do there. And so those guys were around the corner. <laughs> and so when people came up and saw this booth, which like, I mean, it was like, wait a minute, what the, what is this? You know, they're coming in thinking we're going to be serving margaritas or something. And they would come in and like, what do you do? And it was so awesome because people came in. So we had way more traffic than normal. We did a bigger booth. Like then I normally had a 10 by 10, this one's 20 by 20, so it was a lot bigger, it's 400 square feet and just, you know, a lot more setup, a lot more stuff to take down there, but um, it worked. Like, and the great thing is now we come home with that stack of business cards, it's a lot bigger stack of business cards because we had so much more traffic and you call and say, this is Curtis with two kios, and they're like, oh yeah, those weird guys in the hut, immediately. Nobody like, was like, who again? I mean, you might say two kios, like, wait, what? And it's like, the guys in the hut, you may have to say that, but they're gonna remember us. So from like, you know, when you think about like, what should you name your business? Funeralrecording.com probably makes more sense for like what that business was. Tukio's, you know, you're talking about making, like people will talk to you about how to name a business and they'll say, you know, don't make, make it anything hard. Make it where like your name makes sense. People hear your name, they know what you do, whatever. I mean, people can do whatever they want, but this worked really well for Tukio's. And you know, for, for, to go from, you know, zero in five years to the second largest tech company in the industry, I think is pretty significant. So that's the first lesson, just be different and it's worked for us. Another one here is less like this cell design build model. While I was here at Weber State, um, I was in the, like in the Weber Entrepreneurs Association on a Wednesday night, we're having our meeting and somebody said, 
we should all go down to this thing in Salt Lake. It's called Junto, and I'd never heard of it. And um, they don't do it anymore, but it was kind of like this, like, you know, they accepted 20 applicants, and it was like tomorrow night, and this guy is going to teach people how to start businesses in, like, really unique ways. And so I'm like, oh, that sounds way cool. Like, I'm going to go down. So I go down there, and there's these 20 seats, like, up front, and there's this, like, you know, kind of like a crowd of people watching these 20 guys, but one of the seats is empty. And so the first night, like the guy's talking to us about are entrepreneurs born or they made, he's just really, really cool concepts, got me really fired up. Um, but there's that one empty seat. And so I went up at the end and I said, like, hey man, like what's this empty seat up here? And um, they're like, well, the guy dropped out. And I'm like, well, can I get in that seat? And they were like, well, tell us what you do, <laughs> you know. Anyways, they got, I got in. So I got into this seat. So. I, I, for the next six weeks, I'm part of, it was almost like Survivor, like you're getting like, you know, almost like voted off, you're getting these challenges every week, it was really hard, it was like some things were embarrassing, and it was scary, but um, learned so much about like entrepreneurship in that six week course, but uh, one of the like concepts taught was sell, design, build. I learned a lot more, but this is the only one I'll talk about from that thing that, that was really impactful for me. He talked about like the, uh, really you needed to like go out and sell a product before you actually build it. And so at that time I was still doing the record, audio recording stuff, thinking about this webcasting thing, and I got some bids from some programmers. I'm not a computer programmer myself, so I didn't know how to build this. And so like I got some bids and realized it was gonna be about fifty grand to build this. I didn't have fifty grand. And so I'm like, okay, I gotta figure this out. And so learning what I learned at this this uh, Junto course to go sell the product before I design it, before I build it. I'm like, okay, I don't need the fifty grand right now. I'm going to go to another one of these funeral trade shows. So this is prior to two kios, um, when it was just funeralrecording.com still. So in 2008, we go to this trade show in Orlando, and I brought like my brother with me and like a friend, so we looked like a bigger business than we really were. And so there's three of us in there, and I actually did have one employee at the time, but he was he had to like edit the re audio and send the CDs out still, so I couldn't bring him. But so we go set up this booth, and I was using something similar to Skype, and totally faking it right so people would come up and be like well, yo funeral webcasting like yeah we've heard this is like all the rage like how does this work because there were uh, there was two other funeral webcasting companies and it just so happens that we were all at the same intersection so there was mine and then these two guys that were that seemed pretty big and legit so it's kind of scary for me because you know they're kind of peeking over my shoulder to see what i'm doing and i'm just thinking like man i hope they've never seen skype before you know because <laughs> like i'm totally faking this thing i've got these 3g because it's prior you know before 4g days I've got these 3g at&t cards running my internet in there because I didn't have enough money to pay for the trade show internet. And so I've got the one laptop here with a camera and we're pretending to broadcast. We were broadcasting, but nothing's recording, nothing's legit. And when someone would say like, okay, I gotta do this. Your pricing is, because I had a price for a product I didn't have yet. Your pricing's better than those guys, so we're gonna go with you. Show me this from start to finish. Family just sat down with me. They said we want to webcast our funeral. What do we do next? Show me on the computer. And so I'm like, all right, I'll show you. And so that's when I would go over and like disconnect my AT&T 3G card from the USB extension cable I had going under my table. Literally, this is what I did. I would kick it out so I no longer had internet. And then I would go to like funeralrecording.com slash webcasting because I'm like showing them this is how you schedule a broadcast and hit enter. And then I'd be like, gosh dang, this stupid trade show internet, this convention center sucks. Like, <laughs> I'll have to show it to you next week, right? And so just totally, but again, got the stack of business cards, got some interested people. And now I'm like, all right, like, we got people that are going to buy webcasting. I sold it, so let's go design it and build it. I got an SBA loan, paid a guy to build the webcasting. That's how we started the business. And what I demoed for people that day looked and functioned nothing like what we actually built. But it worked. I was able to kind of validate the product. So when people come to me, friends, whatever, family, and just say, like, yeah, I got this idea. Like, how do I do it? Definitely try that. If you can go sell it before you can build it, we sold. I totally pre-sold two kios before we ever did a slideshow. Like I was making them an iMovie, getting people to send me photos just to see, can I actually get my clients to buy into this? You know, and it worked. And so sell, design, build. Like I'm all about that model. It just like totally changed everything for me. So um, another like lesson I've learned is like how to bootstrap. So if you haven't heard of that, like the definition is like getting in or out of a situation using existing resources. So like I said, like this, I'm gonna tell you about this booth and about like stretching every dollar because this is what our trade show booth looks like now. 
also really weird and really funky and it's made out of fabric so you look at that and people think it's this big block of wood and it's 16 feet tall so they're actually pretty big um, but it's made out of fabric so it's really light the whole thing weighs like 70 pounds you can stand those like things up pretty easy and we just stuff them with swag down in the bottom you know shirts and sunglasses and stuff that we give away so this booth like I we did again like I've, like my whole all of my startup stories were like trying to build something with no money and so with Tukio's, like when we did this, I, I was like, okay, I've got this concept in my mind. I was trying to find a napkin where I actually drew that booth because I drew the booth on a napkin with the Tukio's logo. The logo on top actually spins around in circles. So it's like, you know, just everything we can to kind of stand out. And so I drew it on a napkin and like went and talked to some people at the exhibit companies, like Skyline exhibits and stuff. and saw like maybe who printed these, these uh, banners here. And they were like, yeah, we could totally build that for you. It'll be 110 grand. Like it'll, you know, it'll be awesome. And I'm like, oh man, like 110 grand. I got like, you know, I don't have 110 grand right now. So we built this one ourselves. <laughs> so I found this dude down in like far west over here that like knew how to put motors together. So he built the motor for the top. Anyways, the whole thing's built out of like sono tubing and aluminum pipes, fiberglass, and this grass thatch that I bought online and TVs. And so like the whole thing cost me about 14,000, but a whole lot cheaper. And that's about, I think I had like, Fourteen thousand, like two hundred dollars in the bank. So I spent everything I had on this booth, um, and now like I've got to go take it to a trade show, and I so I just rented a U-Haul, threw everything in the U-Haul, and drove to Vegas. And this is how Tukio was launched. Like so again, like scraping, no money, like spend everything I got, and get down there. And um, while I'm pulling up to the, has anybody here done a trade show before? Can, like you, yeah, okay, trade show. So you know how the conference centers are read ridiculous like they charge you to plug things in they charge you to carry every box so I pull up and I'm like you know we've never done a booth this big before all my other booths for like, for funeral recording I fit them in like a golf bag and just pulled them in and set it up so I'm like I don't know how this works and so I'm like obviously we're not walking this thing in the front door people that'll be weird right so I'm like that isn't gonna work so I pulled around I parked and it was at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center and I walked around the back and talked to somebody at the dock and I'm like this is what I've got going on. How, how am I going to get this booth in there? You know, I've got this U-Haul full of stuff. I'm like, well, how much does it weigh? I'm like, man, the thing's got to weigh like 1,000 pounds, I bet, the whole thing. And they're like, okay, how many pieces are there? I'm like, well, well, you know, I don't know, 200? And they're like, okay, well, it's like $2 per item. And then um, it was like $5 a pound or something. I can't remember what it was, but all I remember is like, I added the numbers up in my head. I'm like, Okay, it's gonna be six thousand dollars to unload this U-Haul that I just loaded myself in Ogden, and I don't have six thousand dollars right now. I just spent all my money on this booth, and Tukio's didn't really exist, right? Like it was same kind of thing. I set this booth up. I didn't have a working product, so I built all that booth before we <laughs> had a working software product. And so I'm like, okay, we got to do something about this. So uh, I go back, and I had some guys working for me at the time. So there were six of us down there, and I'm like. They, need, they want like five or six grand to move our booth in and I don't know where we're going to get that money. I wasn't going to ask them for it, right? And so I'm like, we got to sneak it in somehow. So we <laughs> go in and we find our spot on the exhibit floor. Like, okay, here's where we are. And we went and found an emergency exit. And I'm like, the alarm will sound. Don't push this door. And I'm like, I'm just going to try it. Because if the alarm doesn't go off, I think we can use this door. <laughs> so pushed it and like started to run and it doesn't no alarm goes off so I went back over and duct taped it open so it wouldn't shut <laughs> and then it opens to this hallway where like these security guards were kind of just patrolling the convention center but on the other side of that hallway was another emergency exit out to an alleyway and so duct taped this whole thing open it's kind of like an Ocean's Eleven operation in Las Vegas here and we've got like our computer programmer who's way too nerdy to he can't help us like he's he can't pick anything up like he was just gonna be useless so we just had him stand in the hallway and like basically if there was no security guard he would push the door open a little crack so we would know it was safe and that was his whole job and the other we had a girl working for us that would drive the Suburban pulling the U-Haul around the convention center she'd pull up we would open the U-Haul, grab these big trees, and go running in there. So we snuck the whole booth in the back door and didn't pay a dime. And the convention center came around and says, well, wait, how'd you get this in here? It's like, well, you know, I don't know. And we just didn't, didn't really answer them. They gave us a citation for having a booth that might in, like just go up in flames at any minute. It's a fire hazard, apparently. And so we just threw the citation in the garbage. They never came back. 
totally, it was okay. Like everything was fine. And then we snuck it back out when the time came. The, you know, the trade show's over, we snuck the whole thing back out. And that totally worked. And you know, since then we've had more money, we've been able to buy crates and ship things and people set up the booth and it's, it's not like that anymore. But that, that like, that's kind of like <laughs> a pretty normal story at Tukio's is just how we just bootstrapped and did everything we could to, to, could to save money. Uh, the next trade show we did after this one, luckily we'd grown quite a bit because the next, show, next trade show we, we spent about $35,000 on that trade show. And that one, like it was in Chicago, same kind of thing. I'm like, 30, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be a lot of money and I don't know if we're gonna be able to afford it. Took eight people to Chicago and we ended up like I'm cashing out my PayPal account on the drive home from Chicago, not the flight. Like on the drive home from Chicago, I'm cashing out PayPal accounts just to be able to buy gas so we can make the get the booth home and the truck home. Barely scraped by, and then somehow a week later we're able to make payroll. You know, I mean it was just crazy, crazy stuff. But total like bootstrapping. I mean, I don't know. We've got a lot of friends who have. Uh, and we raised money at one point too. So like we, at one point we had a lot of money and it was still like I was paying myself peanuts at the time until we were profitable. I didn't feel like it was fair for anybody for me to be like, you know, pulling money out for myself or be blowing money. And so even after like we raised some money, some seed money, we we're still very much this way. Like always, always, always just like bootstrapping as much as possible. Um, so this is obvious, like, right? yeah, like lesson four work, but this is so important to me, and this is something that's like really important to me all the time, and it's, this is how I live my life, is just like, in the business, the first point that I've got, like, work like you're off the bench, any 49ers fans in here, familiar with Colin Kaepernick and Alex Smith, Alex Smith gets hurt, Colin Kaepernick goes in, back up, and all of a sudden they go to the Super Bowl, right? Like, whoa, how did that happen? And now he sucks? Well, so that kind of, you know, I'm a 49ers fan, so really frustrating but if you think of like how he went in off the bench or like um, Jeremy Lin with the New York Knicks Lin Sanity no one knew who that guy was all of a sudden he blows up because he's working because he knows like they're gonna put me back on the bench if I don't crush it while I'm out here right and so um, just you know that's so important to me like be able to out hustle your competition I feel like that's really the only thing we've got going for us our competitors like you know, there's this one that's that's still bigger than us. It's like they've got they've got so much more money than we've got, and they've got like investor-backed products and all this stuff they're doing. And they have so much access to capital, but they're so complacent and so lazy. We're just killing them, and it's because of that. Like we're always about out hustling the competition. Yesterday morning, like our competitor, our biggest competitor has a desktop application, so it's more similar to iMovie. It takes hours and hours to make a video, but they still have the market share. They're 15 years old. And so their business has been around a whole lot longer than ours. So yesterday morning, just to try to like really like get my sales team to be all about, you know, like firing up about, you know, let's let's get off the bench kind of an idea. I made up a fake press release. And I wrote this press release. The company's called Funeral One. They're our biggest competitor. So I wrote this press release as though I was Funeral One. And it was like Detroit, Michigan. You know, if you've ever seen a press release, you put where you're from and what the date is, and then you tell you what cool thing you did, right? And so it's like Detroit, Michigan, March 15th or 14th, I think it was, yeah, March 14th, and explained how they launched this new web-based product that does everything that we do, that streams directly to TVs like we do, and does everything we do, and it's cheaper. And like, sent that out to like my team yesterday morning, like, can you guys believe this? They were pissed. I mean, it was like, sales calls at 10 o'clock every Monday morning. These guys were going berserk when I got on the call. And it was exactly what I wanted to happen, because I, you know, even, even though we continue to grow, last year, we grew 70% over the previous year. We always are close to that doubling the company every year. It's been really good, really fortunate the last few years, but um, I still stay up at nights just thinking like, you know, did we hustle hard enough today? Like, did we seriously do everything we could today to keep beating the competition? And I was so last weekend, I like stayed up pretty much all Saturday night just thinking about this. And so I'm like, I need to get my sales team to have that same experience. So sending that press release to them, it was awesome because like, I'm listening to them on the call and I'm just feeding the fire like, man, I know, man, these guys, they copy everything we do and just letting them get so mad. And about 20 minutes into it, they're like, okay, well, I know what we're gonna do. We don't need to be worried more. It's like the sales guys are, we're gonna out hustle them. Like we're gonna double our calls. We're gonna, you know, all this stuff. They came up with all the ideas that I already had. And I'm like, okay, well, awesome. You guys are gonna love this then. I lied, I made that press release up. 
that didn't even happen. Like they're still the sucky desktop application. They haven't done any of this stuff. And they're like, oh man, you know, like so. Anyways, it totally works. It's just like trying to get that hustle mentality into the guys. It's, it, that's like I say, that's pretty much what we've got going for us. And just being different, staying weird when we do ads in the magazines and stuff because they still look at magazines in the funeral industry. They still like to get a printed magazine and they flip through and they look at their ads and call the guys that look cool. It's crazy. Like the whole digital marketing world's kind of, they're missing it. A um, couple other ideas on work. If you've read the four hour work week, it's really got some great ideas. It's a nice book title, but Tim Ferriss isn't working four hours a week. That guy's working 60, you know, and guys that really, if you look at like, you know, some of my you know, like business idols, the regular guys, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, those guys aren't working four hours. They are busting their butts every day, staying up at night, stressing about what they're going to do tomorrow. Like, you got to be that way. That's what seriously makes it work. And so people that think, like, I'm going to start this affiliate marketing company, and I'm going to work four hours a week, and I'm going to live in Thailand, like, I don't, I don't really love that idea. You, you, you know, anyways. Um, and then I'll just share one last lesson. We got some food here. We can open up for questions or whatever. But it's just focus. You know, like so many of my friends who have started businesses, and then from my own experience, um, and tried to moonlight or tried to have a double strategy or run more more than one business at a time. Let me back up really quick. I am a believer that if you're going to start a business and you've got six ideas. I don't think it's a bad idea to try to start all six of them at the same time and see which one is starting to stick. And when that one starts to move, drop the other five. Just throw them out. Like, and focus on one single thing. And if you really want something to grow, no moonlighting. I, what I mean by that is like a day job. I don't, you know, I don't know anybody yet that has worked at a day job and built this massive business on the side. You know, they really start to gain traction and really start to grow when you throw your hat in the ring and actually get in there and start working really, really hard. Um, and uh, yeah, another idea, I mean, I've got, so I, st I have a business partner with two kios and I, I love the guy as a person to death, but I had to fire him from two kios and, and the reason was is that he had other businesses going on. And so it was just like, we, we only let it go on for like two years, but uh, it's poisonous to a team and everything filters from the top. So it's like, you know, like I said, for me to get these sales guys to, like be anxious about hustling like I was I had to do something from my position to get them to feel that way so they would want to hustle they're just, they're just, you know a lot of guys don't just pick that up on their own they don't just feel like they don't stay up at night like the business owner is going to do and stress about things so that's really important and just focusing on one thing and then just this thing I, I thought of this the other night you know, it's not multitasking it's really rapidly changing focus when people are like oh I can mul run multiple businesses I'm a good multitasker no, like our brain does one thing at a time. And if you're multitasking, it's like, you can't be doing this and thinking about that and do this good. You can really only do one thing great. And that's what I've learned the hard way because the first couple of years of Tukio's, it would have been, it would have grown so much more had we not started Bragfire. And as fun as Bragfire was, it was awesome. I mean, those trade shows were so rad and that industry was so fun. And we're like, you know, going, to Grand Cayman and you know, like Cozumel and all these really cool places for meetings and sales trips. And it was so fun, but the other business suffered and this one still kind of sucked because we had to run this one still. So trying to do two things just really doesn't work all that well for me. Um, so we, if I don't know what the schedule is, questions, food. This is my contact information if anybody wants to reach out to me for any reason. Um, my name's Curtis Funk, and it's, I was saying to somebody, like, it's pretty easy to get that handle and that email address everywhere. There aren't very many people with the last name Funk. And uh, so anything is just Curtis Funk at whatever, and you can find me there. But should we open up for questions, Dave? Is that the plan? Okay. I pretty much just spoke, if you guys didn't notice, without breathing for 50 minutes. <laughs> so any questions for me? Yeah. So with Two kios, you had someone actually write your own program and then it wasn't already existing? Yeah, really good question. So um, started, I started having a couple, I, I started like having two programmers at the same time because I wanted to decide which one's going to work harder. And so they both built like um, like a kind of a minimum viable product kind of for me. And uh, one built it on one platform and the other one was trying to build his own thing from scratch. And he was taking forever. And this guy that used something that already existed 
had me like a slideshow creator in like 48 hours. I'm like, okay. So it was built, at first we were built, we were using a video rendering technology from a company in France. And we used those guys for a couple years and what made me bail on using their tech, because they rendered video kind of like faster than real time, but not as fast as we do now. What made us bail on them is they would never invoice me. And so like all of a sudden I'd get this invoice it's like, oh, you owe us 150 grand for last year's videos. I'm like, sweet. I'm like, why don't you tell me that every month for the last 12 months? And so, it just kept being that way, and it just drove me nuts that like they weren't billing us regularly. So we built our own software to get away from them, and we wrote it on video gaming technology. Because if you think of like if you're playing a video game and you move your controller, it's, there's a million scenarios that can happen right now, and they have to happen faster than your eyes can see it. And so our video rendering is written in OpenGL, similar to video gaming. So we rewrote our own. So yeah, that, that's a good question. We did definitely for the bootstrap piece because we would have spent another 50 or 100 grand, which we probably spent 100, 150,000 on our video rendering technology. Um, but we would have spent that up front, you know, where we can get a product to the to the customer right away for less money if we use this guy's tech. So we just built a front end over their video rendering early on. So good question. I saw some other hands. Other question? Yeah. Um, you talked about how you did. Much. Um, has your education helped you at all? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> high school, I was just such an idiot. Like you know, but like college was a lot different. Um, I graduated here with like a three eight. Like really, put a lot of effort into school here and uh, took classes that were most applicable to me, which was fantastic. Because it's like you know, I take a customer service class, and it would something I learned today, I can go apply it today when I. And when I drive over to the office. And for a while there, our office was just right across the street right here. And we're always kind of in an Ogden. We're on 25th Street for a while. So I was always kind of close to Weber State and Layton, East Layton here. So it was really cool to come to class and then just go apply it. Um, but once I was all done with school, it definitely would have had like even more of a head start. But I, you know, going back, I, I loved doing them both at the same time because it kind of let me apply things right away and kind of you know mold them into my character I guess you could say so yeah education no I'm not dogging education I was a terrible student but education is fantastic <laughs> so. um, any other questions people have, yeah, I have one. so so first you're a younger guy and I'll take a shot in the dark and guess that you were even younger when you started two kilos and uh, so Good guess. how did you get sort of a more established industry to take you serious so any tips for students and that's a really good question. I mean, I was, you know, customers would come in our booth and say, well, you know, who's the owner? Because, you know, we'll have eight or ten people in there. Well, it's that guy. And they're like, he's a baby, you know. <laughs> and so I don't, you know, let me think about that for a second. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what totally did that. I think it was, it was really kind of the product, you know. Just being able to demo it for them and show them it was better. And one thing I didn't mention that... Um, while I was here going to my, like Tony Allred, I don't know if he still teaches, but I'm in his marketing class and he had us write a business plan. And so I just wrote the business plan for two kios because I was about to build it. And um, one thing I learned from funeral recording is there were these other technology platforms already in the industry. And this has been this, one of the secrets to our success is I, I identified in that, while I was in that class, nine like website providers that provide websites to funeral homes. And I was like, okay, like if I can get these guys, if we can build like an API with two kios that can be built into these website platforms, you know, this guy's got 7,000 clients. So it's like, we build into his website, we have access to 7,000 clients and they'll just be able to make videos through their website. And so I wrote that idea there. And a lot of our credibility, I think, has come through that. Because I, me personally, I, I spent maybe a year or so trying to sell like funeral homes on two kios. But ever since then, um, it's all been focused on these API partnerships. So those nine guys, it just so happens that all nine of them as of November 2015 have two kios integrated into their software platforms. So we got all nine of them and that's where all of these leads are coming from. When I mentioned earlier we have like 250 reps out selling, it's for those nine companies. And so they, their guys are out selling on their product but we're built into it. And so they love any reason to go in the door and say, hey, we got this new thing, it's called two kios, it's built into our sites. Um, but building those partnerships, like the first one we built was with a company called Tributes.com. 
It was started by a guy named Jeff Taylor, who uh, he started Monster.com, like the big job site, and he sold that for like 120 million or something, and built built tributes because he basically looked at like newspapers and said, you know, classifieds, job classifieds are what are keeping these guys in business. So he moved it to the web with Monster, and he noticed the newspapers didn't go away, and he's like obituaries he hated the newspapers <laughs> so, <laughs> obituaries you know so he built tributes to try and kill the obituary so we built into them and that brought in a lot of credibility even though it's you know baby face guy in there that seemed like he didn't know anything who really didn't know anything but these people I think that was really kind of it it's just building partnerships with people that already had the credibility that's probably what got us past that that was a great question I have two questions questions one is like how did you like survive like when the, in the early phases of the of, of Kukio's kind of you know strapped for cash yeah and how long did it take you to like get to like where you felt established um good question so like our our business now is pretty decent size and it's still a small business but you know I mean our revenues are doing great very profitable I still don't feel established you know <laughs> I think like I don't want to um, early on, like how I personally survived, my wife had a job, and that's seriously what did it. Because there was like a year and a half where I didn't pay myself a single dime. Like I didn't make a, any. I, I, when I first started, I quit my job, bought the thing for my brother, and started. And I, right out the gate, I was paying myself from the clients we already had. But at that time, my wife was in school; she didn't have a job. The minute she got a job, I'm sure she didn't like it. But I was like, so. I got an idea, you know, like, I'm not going to make money anymore. Are you okay with that? <laughs> and we're just going to use your money. And uh, so we did that. And so she was a school teacher, which they don't make a whole lot of money, but it was okay. Like, we live in a townhouse up in North Ogden. Expenses are pretty low, you know, like cars paid off, like crappy cars. Like, just did everything we could to, like, just scrape by. And honestly, like, when you're in college, no better time to start a business because, <laughs> like, because you can live like that, you know. It'd be a lot harder once you, you know, you, know, you buy the house, you buy the nice cars and everything to try and like scale back. Or it's like, I mean, if I were to try to live off the money I was living off then, it just wouldn't work now for me. Like, I would have to sell a bunch of stuff and go back to my townhouse, you know. So that was, that was it. I was really fortunate that she had a job and it kept me afloat. But I think you kind of you kind of be willing to do that, you know. And most, a lot of the guys, like if you know Jerry Ropolato that started uh, Perch down here and he's got this big white clouds 3D printing thing now. I, I, while we were in the WA, WEA, we had him come and speak to us like this one night, and he told us how he'd started one other company, and then he'd gone to work, and then started a company, gone to work, and when he decided to start uh, what was then top 10 reviews, he told his wife, I'm starting this business, I'm going to go without a salary for two years, are you okay with that? And I was like, man, that's pretty cool, because like, this guy's like, was at that time was like late 30s, early 40s, and you know, he was willing to do that, but I think you kind of need to, because you need to invest every dollar you can in the business. To, to, just to allow it to grow. So, great question. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on that, Chris, because um, Seth Godin talks about this, like the people that fail, they, they don't invest in the business, right? And so for you guys, uh, how, do you, how do you strike that balance? How do you, you know, eventually get to the point where you're paying yourself, but also still investing, you know, so you can stay competitive? Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, still, like at this point, like, um, you know, we'll net 50 grand a month. It's just like profit sitting on top. We will spend a lot of it back as much as we can on crazy things. And ideas will just come up out of the blue. Today, it's seriously, I think, 3.30. One of our guys was like, we should start a March Madness bracket and send it out to all of our clients and give a couple Apple Watches away. Let's do it. You know what I mean? So we definitely, like, we're not, we're not in this, like, I'm not in a situation, like, me personally, as you know, owner CEO, I pay myself through payroll as another employee with a set salary. I don't do any draws. I don't take any profits off the top of the business right now. So I'm still just putting it all back in. And I think until we, you know, my goal right now we got about 10% market share. My goal is to take 20. When we hit 20, I think at that point I'll feel like we'll step into another industry. But at that point, I'm probably gonna be putting the money into this new idea in another industry. So I don't know. I mean. That's how I've kind of done the balance. Is just pay myself like an employee. Yeah, you know, pay pretty well, but yeah. I mean, I think it's that, that's what's that's what's worked. Is just I don't feel right about it really, and I don't know what it is. It's like 
I sit with everybody else in an open workspace. We have offices in our building. Our, our office is down on, right next, like two doors away from Weber State downtown if you've been down there. And it, it's really cool, like, you know, the building owner hooked us up. Looks like an Apple store, glass walls and stuff. And we've got offices, but I refuse to sit in an office. I sit out next to, like, the support people. And I think part of doing that, I sit there and I think, like, uh, I know what I, like, everyone's getting paid. And, like, I, we all of our guys are paid a little above average, but, um, I think if I were drawing the profits from the company, I would somehow feel guilty for that. I don't know why. I think it's just my personality. I feel like my harvest is when we sell two kios. You know, we sell it and I take my percentage of the equity in cash, then that's my payout. But until then, I just don't feel right about it. And I don't know why. I'm sure other people do. But when are you wanting to sell? Like, right now, like all the time. <laughs> Man, like however, however many years in the funeral business, like holy smokes, I'm, I'll sell today. Um, and we, like, so I've, I've, I'm always like kind of putting our, putting us out there, for us to get the right multiple on a sale. Like there are companies in the industry that would buy us right now, but they'll only pay like one and a half to two times revenue. And being a software as a service with with residual revenues, like I don't feel comfortable selling it for that. I'm trying to get like three or four times multiple. So I've been getting us in front of some private equity groups. I've been talking to a few of those and trying to. Just try to drum up the the like the at least the excitement right now. Um, so the business is always for sale. Anybody in here wants you know has got like eight million they want to sell. I got or buy something. I got a business for you. <laughs> that's, that's that's kind of the the situation there. If you were to get like the ideal deal for your business and you sold today, what would you do next? Would you go try to do that brag fire again? Or no, I, I don't. You know that's a good point. I don't know if I would do brag fire again. Um, it was a lot of fun, but I think just because the sale cycle is so long, that was really the killer for me, because I love to be able to sell something that day. But I keep, um, I keep like, I don't know if you guys have seen Trello. It's like a project management thing. I keep a Trello board that's just like a personal Trello board of business ideas that I have every day. And that's part of that disease I talked about earlier. Is like it's. It's so hard to like suppress ideas for me and like just to really just like gain focus. But I have a list of ideas that I would I would put my effort behind and put money behind that I would jump into. Yeah, Definitely start one idea that's already kind of have your viable test behind just kind of once you're ready to jump on. It changes every week. <laughs> but like one that I've been most excited about recently, um, because it's a pain point for me personally is eliminating programmers and i think that's possible and so i've the whole, i've written a bit like the whole thing i've spent way too much time on it kind of like building out how i think it would work how it would grow how it would function what a marketplace would look like with it who the customers would be and basically like if you've seen squarespace wix or webflow or page cloud or any of these sites where you can just go build a site okay those are like front end websites, right? I mean, you can't do anything with those websites. It's just a basic, it's a business card on the internet. And that's kind of what people are building. Shopify takes it a little bit deeper where you got your business card, but now you can sell, right? There's an e-commerce platform. And so I feel like, the, I mean, I don't know what's keeping someone from doing this right now, but I would totally get behind that idea of building, you know, a widget that is social network, like where you can, you want to build your own social network, you just go to a Shopify or a Squarespace or whatever this business is called, type business, do your front end, but then say, oh, my back end needs to be like this. I need to be able to do user management. I need to build slideshow videos. I need to be a, you know, like a photo portfolio site. I need to be this and just have these widgets available. And that kind of opens up, I think, not only an opportunity for people that aren't programmers that want to build a viable like web product or a web application, but it also, there's a second marketplace to it because you've got these people that want to build a site and they want it to be the next Pinterest or whatever. Well, you can throw it together without any programming background, right, with this platform. And, but then at the same time, you've got this other side of it where programmers that are trying to create a business for themselves can come in and write these widgets and sell it in the marketplace, right? So Shopify has got that going very well for e-commerce and selling real merchandise. And they're getting a little bit into subscriptions, but that's pretty much as far as they're going, and it doesn't seem like they're stepping out of that. And so I think that's one idea that I've just been obsessed over lately is like, you know, you know, having that that whole thing eliminate programmers because for me, if I could do that, it's probably it'd be a terrible thing if it existed today. I think because I think every night I would build a new business, and it would distract me, and none of them would go anywhere. And they would all suck. But it's like 
if I had the time to put behind a project like that, then I could build something to actually make money on, right? It also opens it up for like someone who's kind of techie to build web applications for people. He's not a computer programmer. He doesn't understand the languages, but he can go throw a web application together for somebody and sell it to him. There's people, their whole businesses, there's guys down at Weaver State downtown where they build your corporate presence website for you on Squarespace, and then they sell it to you, and then they charge you 50 bucks a month for it, and they're paying nine on Squarespace. That's totally cool. It's totally legit, right? That's what they're doing, and then they're providing a pretty solid service, but they're not like web developers. They're just partially techie guys that know how to use Photoshop, but it now creates a business for them. And so I love that idea of like not only making a cool product, but it opens up so many different markets. So that, that's one that I'm obsessed over. And if anybody has time to do it and you want to do it right now, feel free. Like I'm not like, I feel like whoever, you know, ideas come all at the same time, somebody wants to steal it, take it, great. Like, because I want to use it. So if you can actually build it and you want to go build it, please do and just let me know what the website is so I can use it myself. But so that's one that I'm, I'm kind of obsessed over at the moment. But, you know, by the time we sell two kios, maybe there's something that already exists or maybe some other great idea comes along. And I just thought of like two others that I'm obsessed over, but we won't get into it. But there's, yeah, always, always, always like something that's wasting my time on the side. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Okay, well, sounds like we got some food here. Thanks a lot. Like, I'm really honored to be here tonight. Thanks a lot for your time.